Hey everybody, welcome to week three. I wanted to hop in and give you all a quick once over on what the Panopticon is and what in the world Foucault is trying to communicate to us all with his descriptions of how power works. Today I'm going to give you a few examples of Mikel Foucault's Panopticon metaphor and how power works. Foucault distinguished between two different kinds of power which operated differently during different historical eras. And he did so by pinpointing the place in our history as humans when that power shifted, the plague. You can see here is unceremoniously represented in Monty Python's The Holy Grail. According to Foucault, the plague was history's first example of power working through classification. Prior to that, it worked solely through exclusion. Think about this. Back in the day, small walled cities and towns were surrounded by small villages and then nothing. There was no nationwide or worldwide law. You didn't hit the road and run into a McDonald's every 20 miles. The king or leader of any particular city laid down the laws and that was it. That's what went. There wasn't jails or prisons. There weren't billions of dollars in taxes being collected to house and torture bad guys. There was no war on drugs, no new police cars to purchase next year. All the king had at his disposal was life and death, in and out. You were either part of the group that was following the rules and wasn't contagious, or you were an outlaw. That's where that word actually originated. It meant to be outside of the protections of the law. Someone who was put outside the city and outside of the king's protection, usually to protect the rest of the people there from contagions, whether they be biological or criminal. The reason Foucault uses the term leper is because it wasn't just bad guys and rabble-rousers. Murderers weren't the only people to be removed from the city. It was also anyone who appeared to have a disease that wasn't understood at the time and that might be contagious. And the line between criminality and mental illness, or just illness, was incredibly blurred at that time. Actually, it still is. There was no modern medicine, no magic pill you could take to cure an ailment, no COVID vaccine in phase 3 trials. If you got sick or did something wrong, you got kicked out. The end. So when Foucault uses the term leper, He's referring to stigmatized identities, people with conditions which society classified as contagious and dangerous, and who were therefore restricted to areas outside of the main city. There was a time in human history when we didn't lock people up and classify them as good or bad, as mentally ill or as well, as contagious or safe. Back in the day, we just got rid of them if we didn't want them around anymore. The king would either kick them out or kill them, often in front of a crowd public executions to make example to others who might catch the contagious bug of criminality. But there was a problem, and it grew along with the populations of towns and villages. Sometimes a public execution would backfire. Foucault's book begins with an execution pre-1600s where a man is ripped apart, lit on fire, dragged through the village, and sliced to pieces. One form of torture often wasn't enough. These were supposed to be examples, and they were definitely spectacles of violence in public spaces. But every once in a while, the accused would speak up and convince the crowd that what they were seeing was not just. And every once in a while, the crowd would turn on the executioner and tear them down before they could execute the accused. Now imagine being a king and realizing that the person you've sent to enforce your law has been killed by your people. You'd be in a lot of trouble. Your power would suddenly be threatened. This didn't really reach a tipping point until, according to Foucault, the plague. And at that point, we had no choice but to update the system of power. See, prior to the plague, if you got kicked out, you couldn't come back. And if you got sick, you couldn't come back. And with the sick back then, that probably didn't matter. Because most of the things that you were going to be diagnosed with were going to kill you before you had a chance to come back. But with the plague, things were different. It became obvious early on that those that survived were no longer contagious, nor could they get the disease again. These weren't people that you could kick out of the city, because eventually, you may well have kicked everyone out of the city, and then you wouldn't be a king anymore. So power was forced to evolve. It moved from a system of exclusion, which is simply you're in or you're out, you're dead or you're alive, you're contagious or you're safe, it evolved into a system of classification, a system with various options for labeling and identifying and treating people for whatever it is that they have or that they are. So where the city before had the ins and the outs, 
a wall designed to keep those that aren't allowed out and everyone else in, the new updated cityscape in Foucault's culture of discipline classifies everything. There are places for criminals, politicians, religious folks, laborers, sick people. Everyone is divided up and kept in their place. That's why Foucault sees this as a direct evolution of what was going on during the plague. He provides this description of people being lined up to present themselves to a guard who's standing outside of the window, who looks in and looks them over and asks them how they feel, checks for signs of disease, and then decides whether or not they're allowed to leave the house. If the person in charge of surveilling spots anything fishy, they might flag the person or label them as sick. And then you were in trouble, because from there, you had to either get rid of the label and prove you weren't sick anymore before you could leave the house, or you had to just keep that label indefinitely. We still have the same thing going on in our culture today with people who are labeled as criminals, especially some types of criminals, like sex offenders. So how on earth do you surveil everyone on the planet, including the people in charge of surveillance, because they themselves are also human and not immune to committing crimes? The answer is to create a system in which we surveil ourselves. This is the Panopticon. Let's go back to the plague example one more time and think about the way that you would feel if you knew that an inspector was coming by later that day to check you out and to label you as either healthy or sick. Imagine you get a tickle in your throat and a cough and then you start to sweat. Imagine it becomes pretty obvious that you're sick. You don't have a lot of choices, and you know what happens if this guy gets wind of the fact that you're sick. He's going to label you and diagnose you, classify you, and force you to stay in a specific place where you don't want to stay. The only answer? Performance. Discipline yourself in real time and show him what he needs to see to give you the label that you want. You follow the rules, and the rules say you're supposed to be healthy, or at least look like what the definition of health says for that era. And you can fast forward this from the plague to the way things are right now, the way they're going on today. COVID quarantine comes with a list of self-regulations and self-surveillance. Check your own temperature before you leave. Please walk on the right side of the hallway. Wear a mask in public. So we're headed right smack to the panopticon, Foucault's metaphor for understanding how disciplinary power works, for understanding why and how we surveil ourselves and don't even seem to notice ourselves doing it. With exclusionary systems, pre-plague systems, power originated from the top and flowed downward. It was always one way. It had one source, and it was, in large part, unquestionable. You couldn't appeal the king's decision and try to get back into the city because there was no one to appeal the king's decision to. He was it. But with disciplinary systems, the source of power became fractured, multiplied, segmented. Power can come from many different sources today, and there are multiple ways to tap into it in our culture, multiple people, systems, and organizations that might see your behavior or my behavior and discipline them through different mechanisms. You might say something on a blog that strikes a group of people as racist or sexist, and they might use various methods of discipline to label you as a racist or as a sexist. They don't have to go to the king anymore. They might send your comments to a news organization. They might post them on their blog. They might talk about them in a public venue and add commentary. There are a lot of methods for them to discipline you nowadays, and they're only one of many people who could discipline you. They're one of many people who have access to different powers of discipline. It's no longer just the king. The Panopticon is a structure of surveillance. I've pasted some pictures in front of you to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say the Panopticon is a physical structure. They do exist. They've been built. But the idea goes back all the way to the 1700s to a man named Jeremy Bentham who designed them architecturally to work as a mechanism of power. And he nailed the design because 200 years later, Foucault came across his work and recognized the potential to use it as a metaphor for how power works, generally. The central structure in the Panopticon is surrounded by windows, and from inside it, you can look in any direction, into any cell at any time. But the trick of the Panopticon is that none of the inmates, none of the people, know that you're watching. They can't know that you're watching because they can't see back into the Panoptic Guard Tower. The magic is that one person can effectively guard hundreds or even thousands of inmates or other humans if the system is built correctly. 
In fact, you don't even need a guard because the panopticon is designed in such a way that the people in their cells can never truly know whether or not they're being watched. They have to assume that they're always being watched. It works even when the guard tower is empty. And this changes the way that people behave. We come to surveil ourselves, to self-regulate our own behavior based on what we think the people and organizations around us want and need from us. We expect discipline and punishment if we use the wrong phrase or if we behave the wrong way. If we walk into a supermarket and begin throwing gallons of milk on the floor, then we're doing a terrible job of self-surveilling and self-regulating, and the panopticon will certainly step in and let us know that there are indeed people watching. But you won't see those people until they need to show up and stop you from smashing milk on their floor. That's because generally, the fact that we know they're probably there, waiting to stop us if we do smash milk on the floor, that knowledge is usually enough to force us to self-regulate our own behavior. Foucault, quoting Bentham, said power should be visible and unverifiable. It's the magic of the panopticon. You can never really know if you're being watched or not, so you have to act as if you're always being watched. And think about how this works even beyond the inmates to the operators of the panopticon. This image will give you a good idea of the way the guard tower itself is designed as a panoptic structure within a panoptic structure, a panopticon within a panopticon. Bentham thought of everything, including the fact that the guards would also want to slack off if they weren't being watched. So the panopticon is built to prevent the detection of an approaching guard. Shadows and sounds and echoes are blocked. The swirling staircase around the outside is designed so that you can pop your head up or down and check on somebody who is above or below you without them knowing. The room is circular, so if you're looking out at the inmates, somebody can always walk up behind you. The structure is designed so that the surveillers also have to think that they're probably being surveilled, but they can't really know, so they have to behave like they are. And the people who are surveilling the surveillers also are beholden to this system, so every step of the way, everyone acts as if they're being watched, but they never really know if they are or not. That's how the panopticon works. Now there's two things to keep in mind here. Number one, the real world works just like prison in the panoptic power structure as we live in now. And number two, even though Foucault feels thick and rich, he's really not that difficult to understand. So I want to do it together with this one giant sentence that feels really boogery and difficult when in reality it just takes some slowing down and thinking about to get through it. He has the ability to pack a paragraph into a single sentence. This enclosed, segmented space, observed at every point in which the individual is inserted in a fixed place, in which the slightest movements are supervised, in which all events are recorded, in which an uninterrupted working of writing links the center and the periphery, he's talking about recording things here, writing them down, in which power is exercised without division, everybody talks to everybody else, according to a continuous hierarchical figure, each individual is constantly located, examined, and distributed among the living beings, the sick, and the dead. All of this constitutes a compact model of the disciplinary mechanism. And as you've just seen with the images I flashed on the screen, there really isn't much of a difference between different parts of the system. We accomplish this in both cases through cultural classifications, through labels. You can think of those of you that have heard of or been on academic probation and how it's a label used to put you in a certain place and to make sure you have to follow certain rules. Or your criminal record, which follows you around the same way. In the DSM-5, which we use to label and diagnose people. You can also think of the labels you obtain or have that get you into certain areas or keep you restricted in the way that a lot of these areas aren't really that policed. They work like a panopticon where you could walk right past or drive right past many of the signs, but you would still be worried that you're going to be policed even more once you do that. You're supposed to police yourself. So that's a quick once over of how the panopticon works in our daily lives. There are a lot more examples and I'll talk in class on Tuesday more specifically. Plus I'll share my experience of living in a panopticon. In my case, the largest walled prison in the world in Jackson, Michigan.